what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? And how do they help us understand biblical reliability? What are some secrets about the Dead Sea Scrolls that maybe some people have missed? Well, we're going to explore that topic today, and I've got a special guest. His name is Dr. Anthony Ferguson. Just recently did his doctoral research with some of the leading scholars on the Dead Sea Scrolls, but he's also the lead pastor at 11th Street Baptist Church in Upland, California. So he's used to translating complex ideas down to people who are also not particular experts in those areas. So first off, thanks for just pouring so much time and your research and effort into studying the scrolls in a way that translates and is very meaningful to me and many other people and for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's just jump right in. For some people who maybe forget some of the background of the Dead Sea Scrolls, before we get into some of the particular questions such as related to the great Isaiah scroll, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls and how were they first discovered? Yeah, so the Dead Sea Scrolls is a a popular name that's given to about a thousand manuscripts that were discovered in the Judean desert in roughly late 1946, maybe early 1947. Um, You know, there's contradictory stories about the way they were discovered. You know, you have Bedouin who discovers some, uh, a treasure of manuscripts in the Judean desert and they want to keep it hush hush. So, you know, there's not quite exactly the right stories coming out. Uh, But the story goes that there were three or five Bedouin uh, following their goats. um, And they just threw a rock into a, a newly eroded cave and heard the the sound of a smashing jar and uh you know probably frightened but intrigued uh uh they returned and uh that's how it happened uh we have uh, the discovery of six or seven initial uh scrolls in what's cave one and then uh just the floodgates opened shortly after to uh for about the next decade of discovering uh, about another uh, in total of approximately a thousand uh manuscripts but this wasn't the first time that manuscripts were actually discovered in this region. There's actually uh, Dead Sea Scroll discoveries that date back to the third century AD. So the church father Origen, Eusebius, talks about him finding manuscripts uh, in Jericho. And actually these uh, manuscripts um, are actually uh, um, found then in what he developed called the Hexapla. And then in the ninth and 10th century AD, we have a story about a Syriac uh, 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 bishop who comes across other manuscripts, which is super, super interesting because uh, we have at that time in in the 10th century in some Syriac traditions, we have about three or four Psalms that start appearing in this tradition. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, when we discovered 11Q5, uh, a a text preserving Psalm, some of these uh, Psalms were found there. So the, for the discovery that we typically think of in 1946 or 47 actually wasn't the first discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but that is uh, definitely the major discovery. We have over a thousand manuscripts, a quarter of which are biblical. The rest are either apocryphal books or sectarian books. Um, but yeah, that's uh, the discovery. That is so fascinating. I've heard some of the different stories and always wondered exactly what do we know. And maybe this is just a part of some of the folklore that has been told differently. And maybe we can't have the precision that we're looking for. But the Bedouin throwing a rock is the coolest, most interesting one. <laughs> so I'm going with that one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, me too. you mentioned about a quarter of these are biblical texts. Talk about what some of these biblical texts are and maybe why these biblical texts are so important. Yeah, so these biblical texts, um, we found portions of every biblical book uh, um, at, at, in the Dead Sea, except for Esther. Mm. Um, you know, we found a, a little uh, section of Chronicles, and, um, you know, I've, uh, Frank Cross, an early scholar, ha- has said that if a, a war made a little bit more, we wouldn't have Chronicles either. Mm. And when you actually look at this text, you know, there's... It's, it's we're pretty sure it's chronicles but it's so so small it's it's hard to tell but you know the scholarly consensus is that we have everything except esther and th- these scrolls are uh, are vitally important for several reasons i mean first of all they're ancient so we have texts that that date from the third century bc to the first and second century AD discovered in this region and and that that means they're uh you know over two thousand years old Another reason why these biblical texts are important is because they're actually uh, 
written in the Old Testament's original language. So okay. the vast majority of these are written in Hebrew. And uh, we have Aramaic portions of Daniel that we've discovered there as well. And in those sections, the original language of Daniel was Aramaic mm -hmm. in those sections from chapter two through chapter seven. So they're important because they're ancient and they're also important because they're not translations. These aren't largely Greek texts or Latin texts, uh, Syriac texts. These are actually written in the original language. So some of the issues that we have to go through as textual critics when we consider translations, we don't have to, we don't have to consider when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're also important because they, they preserve a level of textual diversity that, um, okay. that at that point, we didn't, we, we didn't have in Hebrew manuscripts. So basically, every Hebrew text we, we have besides the text at Qumran fit the Masoretic text. They actually align very, very closely. All of our medieval manuscripts belong to this tradition. All of uh, our texts that we've discovered that date from the third century AD to uh, the ninth century AD all fit this tradition. All of the texts we discovered in the, the Cairo Geniza are belong to the Masoretic tradition. Um, so these, these are important because they're different. They, uh, they present a level of textual diversity that we didn't know or didn't have in Hebrew manuscripts. But I think fourth, they're also very important because in addition to the diversity, they, they also uh, attest to a level of textual unity and textual stability. Mm. Um, and this is especially true when you look at uh, uh, the sites besides Qumran. So the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, refers to manuscripts that were discovered just in the Judean desert. This is the okay. region uh, west of the Dead Sea. Uh, these are these are places like Masada and Nahal Hever, Nahasa Alim, uh, Nahal uh, Dalia, lots of different places. And when you when you divide uh, the locations with Qumran and the rest of the sites, all of the other sites uh, preserve texts that align very closely with okay. the Masoretic texts. And at Qumran, you have it kind of split in half. Half of them align closely with the Masoretic text. Half of them do not. So okay. when you're thinking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and their importance, they're ancient, and that's very, very important. They're the original languages, yep. uh, mostly, and that's very, very important. And then those two facts force us to take serious the textual diversity there, but also the okay. unity that we, that we see there as well. That's really helpful. And for those of you watching going, okay, well, I don't know exactly what the mas Masoretic text is. What do you mean yeah. unity and diversity? Don't we have confidence that we have the words of the Bible as it was written down? That's exactly where we're going to head in this discussion to bring some clarity. And when I was watching your lecture, you pointed out a few things. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm not sure I connected those dots. So right. hang in there with me. I think you're going to find this to be really really helpful before we jump in though i i just gotta ask i want to hear the story behind your interest in doing a dissertation on this because i know there's always a story <laughs> for me i did my dissertation on the fate of the apostles did they really mm. die as martyrs and i just had to know and i was so interested in this for apologetics and personal reasons and it just kept me up late at night yeah. got me up early in the morning to figure this thing out so what motivated you to do it on the dead sea scrolls yeah, you know, in order to, to do a PhD, you have to be passionate about it. It uh, takes a long time and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's probably several different uh, reasons or uh, details that led me in this direction, but um, I'm a bit OCD, to be honest. <laughs> so, the, uh, you know, getting to the bottom of things is something I just okay. like to do. I'm a bit of a checker. And so when it comes to uh, just my personality, the way God's wired me is mm. I, I like to check things. And so, you know, I, I got into seminary and I'm learning the biblical languages and I'm reading these, uh, these uh, editions that have been published and I just want to go deeper. I just want to check what's really behind these things. So <laughs> I think part of it is personality. I think another part of it is, um, you know, my heart. I, um, I, 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 I really just, I love Jesus and, and the mm. gospel is very, very important to me. Mm. And um, so I think one of the biggest questions um, our generation is struggling with is the trustworthiness and the reliability of scripture. That's right. And so I, I think that apologetic reason kind of led me in, uh, into this field. Mm. You know, there was a textbook we were reading in a Septuagint seminar, 
and um, it was my first uh, it was my first um, uh, introduction to the consensus view of the Old Testament. So a lot of Old Testament scholars believe that the Old Testament was fluid, which means it hadn't reached its final form mm -hmm. until the second century AD. And what that means is that according to these scholars, Jesus didn't have a stable text. So when he says things like not a daughter and Iota will pass away, they would say, well, this was a new, a vogue idea that came on the scene around Jesus' time and Jesus was just mistaken. So when I came across this, this view, uh, and then I, I read more what these scholars say. They say things like, not only was the Old Testament fluid, but Jews didn't care about that. And when I read oh. that, I thought, I thought, wow, this is just this author reading post-modernity onto an ancient te text. You know, this is, you know, truth is relative and that's just okay. And when I read that, I just what he did is he cited the Dead Sea Scrolls as his his main evidence mm. on why this is the case. And I was just like, oh man, I got to study this. I got to <laughs> see what's going on in, at Qumran. So that's mm. that's kind of what, those are the factors I think that led to this PhD. Well, I'm really glad that you did. Now, before we jump into the great Isaiah, Isaiah scroll, just basically, I know this is dangerous because you spent years, so you probably want to tell us all about it, but just <laughs> What's the Twitter version of what you studied specifically in your doctoral research? Oh yeah, I'm not very good at tweeting, you know, it's uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, the dissertation's over 600 pages. So wow. how can you put that into a, a tweet? I'm not wow. sure, let's see, you know, make it into an abstract is hard enough. I guess I would say that, uh, you know, the heart of the dissertation really, it, what I'm trying to prove is that, um, really the main text behind the Dead Sea Scrolls is a text very close to the Masoretic text. That's what okay. I'm trying to say. So what we see in, um, among specifically the non-aligned text, and I'm sure I'll define that at some point in, yeah. in the conversation, um, is, is a text very close to what we know as the Masoretic text. That's what I'm trying to prove in the dissertation. Okay. That's super helpful. And yeah. we'll, we will flush out what's meant, the difference between Dead Sea Scrolls, Masoretic Text, aligned, non-aligned, and how significant this is for trusting the scriptures. But when apologists and many people think of the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the first examples they go to is the great Isaiah scroll. So what is that find? Why is it so important? Yeah, so the um, the Great Isaiah Scroll is very, very popular, and it's popular for good reason. Um, first of all, it like the rest of this text, it's ancient. It dates to the second century BC, and uh, so for it's old. That's what makes it popular. Also, the timing of the discovery, it was one of the first texts discovered. Okay. So we had other texts discovered as well. We actually had another copy of Isaiah. We call, Scholars call this 1Q Isaiah B. 1Q just means the first cave, and it was the second text of Isaiah discovered. That was discovered as well. We also have like a commentary of Habakkuk. But 1Q Isaiah A stole the show because <laughs> it was... It includes the entire text of Isaiah. So you have the beginning, wow. you have the end. Um, it has some holes in it. The bottom is a little damaged. There's a few holes in between. The very end of the text kind of wore out, so it had to be re-inked. You had to write the text again with ink again. But by and large, it's completely there. So it's popular because it's ancient. It's popular because it's actually a scroll. And let's make that clear. Most of our texts aren't scrolls. They're fragments. Mm. So really, it would be more popular to call these the Dead Sea fragments, not okay. the Dead Sea scrolls. <laughs> and, but 1Q Isaiah is, is a scroll. And the reason why it was preserved so well is that the story goes, they found it in a jar. So, you know, it's almost kind of sealed in this like wow. time capsule, so to say. And uh, so, you know, it's popular because of its timing, its age. It's popular because it it includes the entire book of Isaiah. It's also popular because it's Isaiah. I mean, you know, most people don't know much about Joel and Obadiah, but people know about Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the same at Qumran. You know, we have about 20 copies of, of Isaiah texts in, in Qumran. We have about five commentaries, and then we have a few little uh, works that are kind of just discussing the book of Isaiah. So Isaiah was popular at Qumran. You know, it's also popular. Its popularity is also evident in the New Testament. I mean, the New Testament quotes, echoes, yep. or alludes to Isaiah quite a bit. And if you just go into like a, a, a seminary library, there's a lot more books on Isaiah 
than there are on again Joel or Habakkuk. So sure. I, I think its popularity is also due to the fact that it's it's uh, it's the book of Isaiah. You know, another reason that makes it so popular is when it was first discovered, it was pretty much unanimous that wow, this text attests demonstrates the antiquity of the Masoretic text. That was basically the consensus view. And so its popularity also was uh, is due to that fact. It, it, it by and large um, uh, demonstrates that the Masoretic text, um, the canonical text for Jews and Christians that is best preserved in medieval manuscripts. That's like Aleppo, the Aleppo Codex, a text from 930 uh, AD, uh, Codex Leningrad from 1008 AD. Um, those were the best texts we have preserving the Masoretic tradition. And now we have 1Q Isaiah A, a text that dates to roughly 150 BC. And it's it's demonstrating the antiquity of the Masoretic text. So this is a, a text that's 1200 years uh, older. And I think that also drew popularity. I think it's kind of in vogue now for scholars to really highlight the differences between 1Q Isaiah okay. A and the Masoretic text. And I think that too now is leading to some popularity. You know, scholars, we like to say new things. That's uh, how we get published. And I think, you know, <laughs> to, to, to talk about how, oh, well, there's actually all this, this diversity in 1Q Isaiah A, you know, that kind of uh, uh, gets the t Twitter clicks going up and the, uh, and the academia, you know, clicks going up. So I think the popularity now is also due to this, uh, this desire to highlight maybe some of the differences. So. Uh, so that, that, that's all contributing to the popularity of this text. So make sure I'm summing this up correctly. The main Jewish text uh, is the Masoretic text, which is also the main text in our contemporary Old Testament yes. from the nine, or 10th, 11th centuries was the copies that we had. When the Dead Sea Scrolls are discovered, we now have at least a copy of Isaiah roughly a thousand years before this, before the time of Christ. So when they compared them together, what did they find? Yeah, so um, uh, first of all, they, 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 they quickly understood that this text demonstrates the, how ancient the Masoretic text is. Um, that, was, that was clear from the beginning. Um, but um, they also discovered that, um, you know, the spelling of 1Q Isaiah A was different. It, uh, you know, I think uh, most of us know that Hebrew, uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, vowels aren't used. The way they, they indicate vowels are with consonants. So actually you have some consonants that do double duty. They can function like a consonant or like a vowel. And uh, the one Q Isaiah A um, uh, likes to indicate vowels, uh, and uh, the Masoretic okay. text doesn't do this with their consonants. So, in addition to seeing the the antiquity of the Masoretic text, they also saw things like, oh, it preserves a different spelling practice, Aramaic influences mm -hmm. all over this text. So it might seem like the the uh, the scribe, his mother tongue, perhaps was Aramaic. Um, also, they understood that this text was probably actually poorly copied. So when you look at um, the amount of scribal intervention in 1Q Isaiah, a, it ha there's a, there, the, the statistics that uh, a scholar by the name of Manuel Tove gives is about one intervention every 10 lines. And in his mind, that indicates careless copying. So they, they noticed all of these things when they looked at 1Q Isaiah, a, but basically the, the, it, it demonstrates how ancient the Masoretic text is uh, because when you look at the differences, it's clear that what's behind it is the Masoretic text. So they have differences like unintentional errors, like, you know, you're, you're reading a, a book and your eyes skip one line to the next line. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. called parablepsis. And, you know, yep. that happens to all of us. If you're just reading a book out, line, out loud, or, you know, I'm preaching a sermon and I'm like, oh man, <laughs> what just happened? You know, it's not, it's not difficult for your eyes to skip. And uh, that happens in 1Q Isaiah A. Other unintentional errors um, include, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, two letters look alike, and that causes a difference, or perhaps okay. 
two letters sound alike and, and that causes an error as well. Um, you know, uh, there's been a couple studies done on the second half of 1Q Isaiah A that actually uh, pro prove in my mind or demonstrate strongly suggest uh, that the second half of the text was actually copied from a manuscript with a damaged bottom uh, edge. Huh. So the bottom was actually damaged. Yeah, so, you know, this huh. text demonstrates the antiquity of the Masoretic text, mostly because when you look at its differences, it seems pretty clear that it's the Masoretic text is behind it. Now, okay. of course, even when you look at the similarities, the text is agreeing with the Masoretic text. Most scholars uh, would say it in the mid 90% range mm -hmm. to even higher, depending on how you do your statistics. So sure. even it's, it's very, it's very close to the Masoretic text, but even in its differences, the MT seems more original. So that's really helpful. Oftentimes what apologists do, and I've been guilty of doing this, is draw from the book of Isaiah conclusion about the copying over a thousand years without maybe putting this in context to some of the other books that are in the Dead Sea Scrolls and some of the larger story. So what conclusions can we draw from this and where maybe should we have a little pause and caution from the example of the Great Isaiah Scroll? Yeah, so I think it's a safe conclusion to draw that one Q Isaiah A demonstrates the precise copying of the Masoretic text. So again, those texts that we have that date to the Middle Ages, um, that is a safe conclusion to draw in my mind. I, I think it's pretty certain most scholars agree that's what's behind 1Q Isaiah A is a text very close to the Isaiah we have in the Masoretic text. So I think that is a very safe conclusion to draw. What's not safe is to say, well, because that's true, therefore the Old Testament has been copied rely reliably. And you know, it should be clear why that's not a safe conclusion to draw mm. based on that one piece of evidence, right? Because 1Q Isaiah A is not a manuscript of the entire Old Testament. It's just Isaiah. So it doesn't say anything about the copying of Jeremiah. It doesn't say anything about the copying of Ezekiel. It's just a manuscript of of Isaiah. And uh, so also, I think another thing is that, you know, uh, I believe that the book of Isaiah was written by Isaiah, you know, you're thinking in the seventh century or so uh, BC. So even, even if you have 1Q Isaiah A that dates to 150 BC, you still have a 500 year gap, mm. a 600 year gap between the original copy of Isaiah and 1Q Isaiah A. So, and there, so there's this big gap that, you know, we, we don't have any manuscript evidence. 1Q Isaiah A is the oldest text of Isaiah we have. So to make that jump that because 1Q Isaiah A demonstrates the antiquity of the Masoretic text, therefore the entire Old Testament has been copied reliably, reliably is just not a, it, it doesn't follow because of the age of 1Q Isaiah A and because it's Again, just a text of Isaiah. So I think so. I think we need to be careful and nuance the, how much we let Isaiah prove. It doesn't prove anything more than that the Masoretic text of Isaiah has been carefully copied. That's great. I love it. So tell me this before we move on to the Masoretic yeah. text. Um, how do we make that jump then if there's five, six hundred years from the time Isaiah wrote this? the text was transmitted before the copy we have today, uh, what would give us co you know, confidence, so to speak, for that time era? Well, I think there's lots of things. I mean, there's lots of circumstantial evidence that speaks to uh, careful copying in ancient Israel. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about that later on. But uh, but also, you know, uh, we, we, you know uh, the Septuagint version of Isaiah had, was copied in about probably the second century BC. So at the same time as 1Q Isaiah A, and scholars are in complete agreement that this is preserving the same text. Mm. Now, the Septuagint version of Isaiah has lots of differences, but it's pretty clear that those differences in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, um, it's pretty clear that the differences in, uh, in the Isaiah text of the Septuagint really derive from the translator. So the translator okay. um, is really, um, he wants it to be good Greek. So, uh, I mean, that's a high priority for him. So that causes him to take certain liberties in his text. 
Also, he wants to make sure that his audience is drawing the proper theological conclusions about God. So, mm. for example, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, in the Masoretic text, uh, when God commissions Isaiah, he says, uh, he says that, hey, Isaiah, when you preach, you're going to harden the people's hearts. Well, the, the Septuagint, the, the translator, he wants everybody to be clear that God's people went into exile because of their sin. It wasn't God's fault. It was mm. the people's fault. So what does the Septuagint translator do? He changes the text. Well, why does he do that? For So that everybody draws the right theological conclusions. So my point so my point is, is that, yeah, uh, you know, um, uh, 1Q Isaiah A is our oldest text, but we also have several other texts. We have 1Q Isaiah B. Like I said, we have 20 texts from the book of Isaiah at the Dead Sea, all circulating around, around this okay. time frame. We also have the Septuagint. And all of these are alluding to the same text tradition. So um, that's good evidence in my mind. It doesn't get us all the way back. We don't have a sixth century sure. copy of Isaiah, sure. but we have all of these manuscripts around the second century BC that are, that are uh, alluding to the same idea and attesting to the same text tradition. Super helpful. We're going to get into some of those uh, circumstantial pieces of evidence that you discuss. But maybe we discuss this a little bit. Maybe just clarify again exactly what we mean by the Masoretic text, how that was copied, and just the compare and contrast with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, so um, the Masoretic text is the name that we give to the, the Jewish canonical text. So this is the text that the Jews currently see as uh, canonical, and it's also the Christian canonical text. It, what, it's been the Christian canonical text at least since Jerome translated the Vulgate. So uh, there's something called the Old Latin, which is a Latin translation from the Septuagint, the Greek translation. And what Jerome realized there was differences between the Old Latin and the, he, the Jews he was talking with. So he wanted to translate directly from the Hebrew. And that's what we have is the Vulgate. And, um, and that translation is from a, a text very close to the Masoretic tradition. So the Vulgate typically always agrees with the Masoretic text. And okay. so once, once the Vulgate um, became the dominant text in the Church of the West, um, it really became the dominant um, uh, text for most Christians as well. So the Masoretic text really is the canonical text for Jews and Christians. If you pull up the ESV, the NIV, the NASB, mm -hmm. all these translations, they're going to say we translate from the Masoretic text Gotcha. And if we differ, we'll put it in a footnote. Mm -hmm. So um, so the Masoretic text, uh, there's several components to it. First of all, there is a consonantal framework. So these are the consonants. And uh, there's also vowels that uh, are put in with mostly dots and little tittles above the line and below the line. Um, it also, the Masoretic text also includes accents. This is kind of like punctuation and uh, the way to sing the text in the synagogue, and also notes that are in the margin and in, uh, in, the, in uh, between columns and in the upper margin and in the bottom margin at the end of books, they're found there as well. So the Masoretic text includes all of that, consonants, vowels, um, accents, and, um, and the Masoretic notes. Now, um, the, con uh, the, the, the vowels, the uh, accents and the Masoretic notes were added in the fifth century AD to about the seventh or eighth century AD. Um, okay. But the consonants that they're adding the vowels to mm -hmm. and the accents to and the notes to are ancient. I would even say the vowels are ancient, the accents mm -hmm. are ancient, but the first time we see them appearing in the text are in the middle ages okay. um so this whole tradition is ancient i mean you can't have just consonants it is you you can't say words without vowels right all right right so there's always been a tradition uh, of vowels even in in greek and in latin you can't just write consonants you have to write vowels mm. so um even in qumran when i said earlier how they like to add consonants to indicate vowels well they're everywhere in the dead sea scrolls and so so there's always been a, a tradition of vowels there's also okay. always been a tradition of accents punctuation and notes but we we first start seeing them in the text really in 
in the Middle Ages, well, actually beginning in the 5th century AD to uh, the 8th century AD. But the consonants are ancient, and, um, uh, and these have always been copied carefully. At least, we could say this, as far as our, ma our manuscript evidence goes back, we have evidence that this tradition has been copied carefully and precisely. So what is some evidence for this? Well, first of all, you have the notes in, in what we call the Masora. Um, okay. uh, at the end of biblical books, uh, you have like how many verses are found in any given biblical book or how many letters or how many words. And the purpose of these notes are to say, hey, if you have more words than you see here, then you've made a mistake. These notes are supposed to guarantee precise copying. Um, but also when you look at some of the differences in let's say some of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we see that uh, we, we see that uh, that these texts have been copied very precisely. So some examples include we have a Leviticus text from Masada mm. that uh, that agrees with the Masoretic text even in a very peculiar spelling. Okay. So um, hmm. basically, uh, you could say the word. Uh, 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 she or it, the feminine pronoun, um, is he in Hebrew mm -hmm. and the masculine is who. And, uh, so basically you have the consonants who, when it should have been he, and, in and you have this in the Leviticus text from, uh, Masada, uh, you have the consonants who, not he. And in the Masoretic text, like Leningrad from 1008, you have the consonants who, and they have, a, they have a point that says, all the, you should read this he. And the reason why that's significant is because this is either an archaic spelling or a scribal error, clearly. Okay. And they didn't, they never changed it. Hmm. From the Leviticus text, that probably dates to the turn of the era. So you're talking, you know, uh, you know, uh, 20 BC, 20 AD, this kind of time frame, all the way to Leningrad. They didn't change it. They didn't change hmm. it at all. It's the same thing in 4Q Jeremiah A. So this is a Jeremiah text that actually is one of our oldest manuscripts. It dates probably to 200 BC. Wow. And it agrees with the Masoretic text um, in a very unusual spelling. So there's huh. this word that typically you have two Ys when you spell it. It occurs about 40 times in the Masoretic text. And one time it only has one Y. And 4Q Jeremiah A agrees with the Masoretic text. Wow. It just has the one Y. That's um, interesting. You even have like a Masada Psalm scroll. This mm. is a Psalm scroll from the book or from Masada that agrees not only in its consonants with the Masoretic text, but also in its layout. That means it's accents, basically. It's not using accents. It's using spacing to indicate a punctuation. But this is agreeing very closely with what we have in the Masoretic text. Peter Gentry and John Mee talk about this in one of their articles, but they say that even Codex uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, these are Greek manuscripts from the uh, fourth, third and fourth century AD. They, they, they not only copy, um, uh, they, they preserve in their Psalm uh, text, even the layout found in the Masada Psalm scroll. That means they're coughing so precisely, they're even concerned with the layout. So that's uh, fascinating. So, yeah, so you have a lot of very mm. careful coughing. And that indicates uh, that the Masoretic text has been copied with precision as far back as our, um, as our evidence goes. Let me say one other piece of evidence. Okay. We have something called inverted nouns. A noun is like the letter mm -hmm. N in Hebrew. And it's likely that Hebrew scribes adopted this, um, um, this, uh, um, this technique of using nouns from Alexandrian scribes in perhaps the third century BC. And what's significant is these are used in the Masoretic text in two places. And What's interesting is they indicate, they could indicate either the text is in the wrong location, or perhaps this text indicates is so significant, it's treated like a book in itself. Happens mm. twice in the Masoretic text. And what's significant is the scribes of this tradition don't change the text. Mm. They, instead, what they do is they copy the signs. That means in their mind, not only are the consonants uh, you can't touch them, but even the signs you can't touch, yeah, which yeah. is very, and that's possibly dating back to the third century BC. So, so I think, mm -hmm. you know, as, 
as, as far back as you want to go with our manuscripts. And let's just be honest, we only go back to the third century BC, which is significant. Yep. I mean, that's, yeah. that's significant still. We, we have evidence, a lot of evidence that indicates that what we have as the canonical text behind our English Bibles has been copied precisely um, and carefully. That's so, so interesting. So in some ways, we can't get back to that original moment we would like to, but the evidence we consistently have is such care and precision in passing on the text because of something God built into uh, the Jewish people and a reverence for the for the text. So we compare the Masoretic text with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And for example, Great Isaiah Scroll, 95% plus alignment. And those differences tend to be really small like spelling. But there's some other books, as I understand it, like Jeremiah that would have less mm -hmm. alignment. Uh, what do we do with those? Because I know the question then becomes, wait a minute, if we had these two lines, so to speak, which are connected, obviously, Dead Sea Scrolls, Masoretic text, texts that are longer, the argument, as you know better than I do in scholarship, is that there was not a stable text during what's called the Second Temple period, which the Second Temple rebuilt 516 BC to when it's destroyed 70 AD, which, of course, is during the time of Jesus. So that mm -hmm. calls into question the confidence we can have that the New Testament writers even had a stable text to rely upon, which would then in some ways call the New Testament potentially into question. So how do yeah. we know that this is not really what follows from scholarship itself? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And that's, that's the major question we're trying mm -hmm. to answer in this field. Um, I would say it's best, the best way to make sense of the data the manuscript evidence is to understand that scribes approached uh, their task of copying in one of two ways. On the one hand, we have a very conservative approach that scholars call repetition. Um, mm -hmm. It's basically you're copying what's in front of you, and that's largely preserved in the Masoretic tradition. The other approach is what scholars call uh, resignification, uh, and so this would be put changing the biblical text. And um, these types of changes, uh, um, so those are the two ways that you approach. And okay. so that, 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 that uh, accounts for the unity and the diversity. So when we're thinking about, okay, well, what is the nature of this diversity? It might be a good way, uh, a, a good way to answer this question. So what, what really is going on in this diversity? When scribes re-signify their texts, what are they really, really doing? And a lot of these things are what we would expect people to do. So on the one hand, we have uh, scribal errors, which you would just expect from any manuscript. I mean, when you're, you're sure. copying a text by hand, this is, this is pre iPhone, you know what I mean? This is pre, uh, <laughs> um, you know, cameras, pre printing press. I mean, uh, you're going to make mistakes. Pre so pen and paper is really what it is. I mean, even that's yes. how far back it goes. That's right. Yeah. And um, so this is uh, this, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. And that and that by itself should demonstrate the attitude of those who are copying the Masoretic tradition to, for it to be so careful and so precise. And the things that we have preserved, like the Leviticus text from Masada, the Psalm text from mm -hmm. Masada, even a text like 4Q Jeremiah A, uh, 4Q Genesis B and, and many other texts, you know, there's many um, that do this, um, it really demonstrates the attitude of this approach. So, so you have the one approach, a conservative approach, but then you also have a resignifying approach. And I think it's best not to see these as uh, against each other. It's not like these were competing approaches. Uh, there's a scholar, uh, Andrew Teeter, who talks about these approaches actually being complementary, And I think that's really, really helpful. So, um, you know, the Bible is difficult to read for multiple reasons. And by the time you get to the second century BC, um, the Bible needs updating. Um, first of all, it wasn't uh, the, the, the actual uh, form of the letters. We call this the script is different. Oh, uh, gotcha. The, the spelling is different. The words are different. You know what I mean? Uh, the language is shifting. Uh, mm -hmm. There's there's confusion about what the text means. I mean, on theological levels. I mean, you, it's it's... I preach God's word every week before God's people, and I have a lot of questions. A lot <laughs> sure. of questions when I 
when I preach God's word. So, you know, you have these people who are trying to make sense of God's word. They're trying for it to be readable to their children. They're, they're, they're trying to make mm. sure that you understand that it's trustworthy and true. So they make changes. And these, this is resignification. And this isn't against the conservative copying. This is actually proving uh, the attitude uh, that the Bible is trustworthy and true. Because they, they, it's so trustworthy, they want you to understand it. They want you to read it. It's not just something you put on the shelf and you set it aside. This is important for life. So they re-signify it. So what are some of the changes they make? Some common ones are like uh, they update grammar. You know what I mean? Just think about English, how much English has changed from you know, a thousand AD to now. I mean, it's, it's, it's unheard of. You can listen to one of Peter Gentry's uh, lectures uh, at the Texting Canon Institute. He talks about this, like, I can't read English from a thousand AD and not many of us can. So, you know, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, these are, you know, when you're thinking about the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy and Genesis, and this is a thousand years after it was written and uh, at least a thousand years. So you have grammar being updated you have words that are being updated. We don't use words the same way. So they insert gotcha. the new word. <laughs> they, in, they interpret the text. They, they want to make sure you're interpreting it properly. So they interpret it for you. They harmonize the text. So, you know, um, in the book of Exodus, for example, um, you know, God gives Moses the instructions for building the tabernacle and then they build the tabernacle. Oh, there's mm-hmm. a tendency to make sure that when they built it, it, it was... Yeah, it was exactly the way God described it. So what do we call those differences? Those are called harmonizations. Um, you know, uh, so there's a lot of uh, things motivating these changes in the text, updating grammar, um, um, changing the script, changing the spelling. You have normalizing the grammar. So there's one text we call it 4Q Genesis K. I talk about in my lecture where basically there are three uh, variants and each variant, it functions to uh, normalize the grammar and style of the Masoretic text. So, uh, and then you have uh, some texts that are, uh, um, you know, they update uh, the language, like I've already mentioned and the spelling. So the conservative approach to copying and the updating approach really fit together and both of them demonstrate Mm -hmm. the antiquity of of our Old Testament. Now, the issue you brought up of Jeremiah, I mean, I, I'm really sorry. I don't know if I'm going to punt on that one, but there's just so many questions, Sean, in this field and um, so much work to be done. Um, I'm not an expert on the book of Jeremiah. Oh, that's um, fine. <laughs> so, um, uh, but when we look at Jeremiah, um, you're right. They're, they're in the Septuagint. There, there is a shorter version. If I recall correctly, it's about 13 percent shorter than the masoretic text and there's lots of debate about which one's more uh, uh original that's a difficult question uh to mm. uh to wrestle through and i don't think i have all the answers i haven't studied that text in that particular problem in a lot of detail but i would say that even when you look at the book of jeremiah you could see that there are different editions of this book So, you know, you have Baruch who's copying it. He copies this book and then, you know, the Judean king burns it. And then Jeremiah tells him to copy a new one. So, you know, in Jeremiah, you have, even in the text, different editions. And then you have in Jeremiah's life, you know, in about 580 BC, the Jews are afraid the Babylonians are going to come and kill them all. So what do they do? They run to Egypt and they take Jeremiah with them. So, you know, there's some historical things going on in the book of Jeremiah that might that might give reason why we have these different editions. But as far as a better explanation than that, I, I, I really haven't studied that, that, that question in a lot of detail. That's totally fair. And I, I appreciate your honesty. It gives a sense for people. You've spent years studying these languages, the Old Testament, the Dead Sea Scrolls, but there's so much more that needs to be studied. And so I would say if students are watching this, we need people, if like Dr. Ferguson, you might describe yourself as OCD, which is okay. I definitely have some of those characteristics and you want to probe into the question of the reliability of the text, there's need for a generation of people to mm-hmm. continue doing the kind of work that he's doing. Now, you make a fascinating point that I had not thought of when it comes to the text. We look at Josephus and his writings, of course, the end of the first century and he makes an interesting contribution 
that we can know there was a stable, authoritative Old Testament text amidst these different lines. What does he contribute to our understanding of this? Well, he contributes a great deal because uh, he's he's trying to uh, defend the historicity and and the antiquity of the Jewish religion to his audience. And what he says is that you know the uh, the Jews have a fixed number of books that they see as canonical, and nobody changes the words in them. And well, what scholars since um, we've discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls like to say is, oh, Josephus was just wrong. That was rhetorical because look at the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, there's lots of changes. And there's a scholar by the name of Ari van der Kooy who helpfully says, well, what text is Josephus talking about? He's not talking about the text from Qumran. He's talking about the temple text. He's talking about the text that's copied conservatively. So Josephus contributes a great deal because he indicates to us that the canon uh, was fixed after the time of Artaxerxes. And more than that, uh, people didn't update the text or change the text. Now, like I mentioned, some some scholars want to say that Josephus was just mistaken. Perhaps this was a, 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 a lie, a rhetorical device. But uh, a scholar by the name of Ari van der Kooy helpfully points out that Josephus isn't talking about um, the text in, in Qumran. He's talking about the temple text. This is the text that was copied conservatively gotcha. and, and, and precisely from antiquity. And so actually, Josephus actually um, contributes a great deal to our understanding of the history of the text. That's that's a really helpful way to to look at it. Now, you give some circumstantial evidence and i've got a lecture that we're linking to below people can go watch and get all the details so maybe just give us one or two of what you consider pieces of circumstantial evidence that tell us we had a stable authoritative text in that second temple period yeah i think one is um the septuagint which is the greek translation of the old testament as soon as it was um Uh, copied immediately began to be revised and it was revised to fit a mt like text so this this dates even before uh the turn of the era so we have a minor prophet scroll from nahal hever a greek minor prophet Mm -hmm. scroll that is updating its text to align more closely with the masoretic text so i think that's a a powerful piece of evidence that yes there's diversity there's differences in the ancient world but people clearly know the best text it's a Masoretic-like text. Why is why is the person who owns the Naha Hever Minor Prophet Scroll, he's updating it because he understands that the Masoretic text is superior textually. So the idea that I mentioned earlier that Jews were okay with diversity um, just doesn't fit the evidence. If it was, why did this guy update his text? Why not just keep the differences exactly the way they are? But he changed it to align more closely with the Masoretic text. Also, we have a, a, a book called a letter called the Letter of Aristeus, which kind of uh, talks about how the Septuagint uh, was translated. Now, scholars doubt the historicity of a lot of this letter, but that doesn't mean there, it doesn't preserve any historical truth. Now, the, go- the, the goal of the author of, of this book, of this letter, the Letter of Aristeus, is trying to convince his audience that the copy of the Septuagint he has is trustworthy. So what does he do? He uh, gives them evidence that they would all agree upon. And some of his evidence is that my text was copied from the right text, a text kept in the temple by the proper authorities. Mm. And again, what that indicates is that everybody in the ancient world understood that text differed, but they understood that the best text was found in the temple. So those are just a few pieces of this circumstantial evidence that indicates a stability. When when was that letter written? Well, it seems to have been written in the second century BC. Okay. Oh, BC. Okay, so this is yes. before the time of Christ, at least a, oh, yeah. a century plus. Okay, very, very yeah. interesting. Now, one of the points that jumped out to me because of my doctoral research on the apostles was the Maccabees' willingness to suffer and die. Mm-hmm. And one of the points that I, of, I often made, even in my doctoral research, was that they're willing to die for the law. Like the apostles were willing to suffer and die. They believed they had seen the risen Jesus. The Maccabees say, we will not compromise the law. You make a further point and say, this actually demonstrates that they believed there was a reliable, stable text. Connect those dots for me. 
Well, again, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's in my mind, circumstantial, like it's not direct evidence. It doesn't sure. prove that there's a stable text, but I think it, it suggests that there is a stable test. And I think what I'm trying to say there is if, if some scholars think the text was fluid, that means you don't really know, um, you don't really know the details of the day of atonement. You really don't know the details of the Exodus. You don't really know the issues related to the Sabbath day. Um, if that's the case, would people be willing to die for it? I mean, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian king, is telling them that, hey, it, it, if you don't worship Zeus and sacrifice these pigs, off with your head. And these Jews are saying absolutely not. And I think what that's indicating is that they believe that that their customs and culture is indeed uh, the word of God. And if, if the text was fluid, I, I, I doubt that they would have this kind of uh, passion to abide by mm. it. That is, that is so interesting, fascinating. You said, you're right, it doesn't prove it, but it suggests it. You start pulling together yeah. these different, the letter, uh, Josephus, the Maccabees willing to die. There's this consistent sense that yes, there's different lines, but we all know that there is a stable, authoritative text that we can trust at this period, even before the time of Christ. Right. That's so interesting. Uh, so while you're doing this research, obviously you went into this as a Christian. You said at the beginning that you love Jesus and you want to encourage Christians mm -hmm. through it. So I'm sure there's a lot of people going, he's biased. Now, I would say, I definitely want to point out that when I asked the question about Jeremiah, it showed me your commitment to scholarship that you didn't overstate something you haven't mm -hmm. studied. So that's something I think people need to see that there is a commitment to truth, even though you have a certain bias, so to speak. But is there anything yeah. in your research that just gave you pause? Anything that undermined your confidence? Anything that made you think, gosh, maybe there's something else I need to study? Or this yeah. is just something I'm going to store away as a problem I'm not quite sure what to do with. And if so, how would you respond to it? Yeah, that's really good. Well, I would say, you know, to be honest, I mean, I, I approach um, my expertise um, believing in the reliability of Scripture. I have certain presuppositions, um, and I think they're warranted. They're, they're, they're not... Um, I think there's evidence for them, so I don't want. I don't have any shame in saying that. I do think that mm -hmm. if you, if your, if if your goal was just to look at the evidence, that's all you want to do, and, that, and that's not what I do. But if that's what you wanted to, just looking at the evidence, then you could draw you could draw two different conclusions from the evidence. Mm -hmm. You could you could conclude that the Bible was fluid because look at all of these differences. That's a conclusion you could draw. I don't think that's the best conclusion because I think when you look at the totality of the evidence, like I've mentioned, all this circumstantial evidence, yeah. in addition to just what the Bible says about itself, um, I, I, I think the better conclusion to, to draw is that amid a diversity of texts, there is a stable text. Now, I think that's the, the better conclusion to draw based on the evidence. Now, um, were there any things that caused me pause? I mean, absolutely. I mean, um, I'm trying to wrestle with um, this um, this discipline. There's not a lot of evangelical, well, let me rephrase that. There's not a, a lot of people studying the Dead Sea Scrolls as scholars that hold my convictions. So in, 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 in some ways, um, um, it's, it, it's kind of lonely. Um, huh. You know, there, there, there are some, there are some scholars hmm. um, and there are certainly Christian scholars, people who believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus. And there are certainly evangelical scholars, but you know, like the doctrines I hold, there's not many people in, in, in my camp studying the scripture. So it, it could be kind of lonely. So, you know, as I was doing this dissertation, I'm just reading over and over and over again, how you can't trust the Bible. You can't trust the Bible. You can't trust the Bible wow. because look at all these differences. And it was a, it was a, it was a very difficult time. It was a time of, it was a, you know, a, a desert time in, in, wow. in my life, just because, um, because what I'm reading over and, and over again. And um, I think that the, the text that caused me the most problem was a Joshua text, 4Q Joshua A, which um, is a difficult text. Um, I think we have an explanation for it, but that was a difficult one. And um, 
you know, anybody could just probably type into Google 4Q Joshua A and find details about it. I don't need to rehash it here. You sure. can look at my dissertation if you'd like to. Um, <laughs> but it's very fragmentary. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I think the scholars who are using this as the basis that, oh, we, you know, there's different forms of Joshua are overstating their case because it's very hmm. fragmentary. It's just, it's not preserved well. It's poorly preserved. Hmm. Um, and even if it was preserved well, how do you know that those who ha had this manuscript thought it was even biblical? Like, there's a lot of assumptions here. Like, when I listen to scholars like Sidney Crawford, great scholars, Eugene Ulrich, fantastic scholars, but um, you know, they, I think, I think what they do is they, they, they make the connection. Look at all these differences. Therefore, there's textual chaos, and I just don't think that follows. Um, so how do you even know that this, it's so fragmentary, you're over, I think they were overstating their case. Mm -hmm. Also, how do you even know if it's biblical? They're actually in Qumran, we have a few, three or four texts where, um, where the people in, in this region are, are kind of reworking Joshua and they're, it's not a biblical text. They just, they love Joshua. They love the story of Joshua and they're, they're just working with what they got. You know what I mean? It's a creative story. You know, we do that stuff all the time. Look at my kids my kid's Bible, you know, you know, they're not, it's not, that's not the inerrant Bible, <laughs> you know, they're taking stories and they're kind of playing with it. And I don't think it's actually a biblical text. It's a kid's Bible. Well, so how do we know that those in this community actually saw 4Q Joshua A as biblical? So gotcha. that was a difficult text to wrestle through. I think partly because there was, I was just reading over and over again, uh, the alternative view, but also I think there's good reason to doubt their conclusion from the evidence. Mm -hmm. That's really fair and helpful. And uh, if I find time for a 600 page dissertation, I just <laughs> might dive in. It's tempting, man. I actually, I decided to do a PhD. I was sitting on the plane studying Michael Lacona's dissertation on the resurrection. The lady's like, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm studying this. I'm thinking about doing a PhD, but I don't know if I should. And she goes, look at you. You're reading this on a plane. <laughs> of course you should. And that was like one of the things that convinced me to. So uh, fun yeah. story. Now, I, I have a couple kind of more personal questions related to how you process this yeah. and then where you see some of the scholarship going into the future. One of the questions is you've studied this in depth and you described it as kind of a desert season for you. You have you, you admit there's people could take this data, interpret it differently, but you don't think it's the best explanation. How do you shift from saying, well, historically, I have a good case that this is a stable text to preaching it every Sunday, teaching yeah. it to your kids, living out this is the word of God, which you yeah. said you have good reason to, but because we're human and we're dealing with the events 2000 years ago, questions remain. How do you bridge that gap personally? Well, I think there's a really practical way. As a pastor, I change the text all the time. Maybe it's hmm. uh, it's a strange idea, but if you just listen to a pastor read the Word of God, um, he makes changes. I make changes. So, like, I might be reading the Bible and I might repeat a word for emphasis. I might uh, be reading the hmm. text and I might uh, uh, maybe it says he said and I'll say Moses said because we don't have the context. So I'm making changes all the time. You know, I really like. Uh, Interesting. I don't know if you listen to. Uh, Shane and Shane, they have uh, some albums about like singing the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of their Psalms titles is Psalm 23. And they're not just singing Psalm 23. I don't know if you know this song, but they're making all kinds of changes to it. They're, they're repeating words. They're adding words. Even the refrain of the song has nothing to do with Psalm 23. <laughs> and, and yet if I were to ask Shane and Shane, like, hey, uh, do you believe the words of your song are actually Psalm 23? They'd say, absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is a liturgical uh, rendition of Psalm 23 that we're singing. And, you know, so when I think about how we as evangelical Christians actually use the Bible, I think that's exactly what we see at Qumran. The differences that we see, the resignification, the updating, the normalizing, all of these things, it's just a community who's using the Bible. So how do I personally deal with it? Well, I see an analogy in how I use it fits with the way they're using it. Um, I think personally, you know, um, um, 
I think God's really, really kind. I believe in the sovereignty of God. So, you know, our texts are fragmentary. I mentioned earlier, we could call them the Dead Sea fragments, not the Dead Sea Scrolls. And that's very yeah. true. Um, but it's the Lord who said that this worm will eat this amount of text and no more. It's the Lord who literally said this amount from 11 uh, Q uh, Leviticus, this much will decay in the soil and this much will not. It's the Lord who said to a cow who was, or a goat who was going to the bathroom on a Dead Sea Scroll, your urine will destroy this text and nothing more. You know, a soldier who has a dagger who rips the word of God in half and tears it to pieces. This text will be in a storage jar. This one will not. You know, I believe in the sovereignty of God and I have the evidence preserved that God wants me to have. Hmm. And that helps me make sense of the data. So, um, so personally, I, uh, I see a lot of analogies in the way I use scripture to the way Qumran uses scripture. Okay. And also I just, I, I, I hold to the sovereignty of God where I could rest in the evidence I have. And I also think about the kindness of God. What if God only had preserved the diversity and not the unity? Hmm. What if all we had preserved hmm. was the texts that are updating and normalizing and the fork and the 4q jeremiah a which or 4q genesis b um you know the leviticus scroll from masada or psalm school what if those decayed and we never had those like i like what if god did that he didn't in his kindness he gave us evidence that speaks to a diversity and a unity and i just thank god for, for doing that for us. Mm. So personally, I handle it in a lot of ways. Um, but you know, theology helps me. Uh, uh, I believe what the Bible says about itself and I rest in the goodness of God. That's such a great answer in a way I had not even thought about the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's very helpful uh, to me personally as well. What does having a text that you trust, its stability in terms of the Old Testament, just mean to you personally or as a pastor? Well, it means that I have confidence when I stand before God's people. I have confidence that I'm preaching to them, not just another book, but I'm preaching to them something unique. I'm preaching them to them none other than the word of God. And thus, because it is the word of God, it is able to transform us. So I think personally, it gives me, it gives me a lot of confidence. Um, I think it gives me a lot of joy. I mean, the Old Testament produces joy. When you read the Old Testament properly, it produces joy because it's God's word. I mean, think about Psalm 1, blessed is the man, you know, who's delighting in the word of God. Like what we have in the Old Testament is something, not just something, it is it is the thing that can produce joy. So personally, it gives me lots of confidence and, you know, it gives me, it gives me lots of, lots of joy. Probably I love that. Things. Tell me, this is a huge question, but you mentioned earlier that there's further areas of research that need to be done. Are there yeah. one or two that just kind of jump out, or where do you see some of this conversation going on the Dead Sea Scrolls into the future? So it's just actually a recent thing that we have all of the Dead Sea Scrolls published and available to the public. Anybody right now could type in dig digital Dead Sea Scrolls or uh, IAA, these websites, and see all of the Dead Sea Scrolls digitized. So they are Amazing. available now to the world. And that's that's new. So I think what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna have a better understanding of, of the biblical texts. We're gonna have a better understanding of the people who left us the biblical texts. Um, I think uh, we can now start to analyze not just we, we can now not only just know how many differences they are, but we can begin to analyze the nature of the differences. So that's what I try to do in my, my dissertation is yeah. that all, all of the differences were published in the, uh, uh, the series called DJD, Discoveries of the Judean Desert, published by Oxford. And what I did is I just tried to uh, describe the nature of these differences. So I looked at all the non-aligned texts and the term non-aligned um, means a uh, there's a biblical Dead Sea Scroll that doesn't align with the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, or in the cases of the Pentateuch, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and it has unique readings. So I looked at all of these texts, and what I discovered was that 
um, that really what all of these texts are attesting to is really the resignification, the approach to copying where you're updating and you're changing, and what's behind them really is the Masoretic text. So I think we're also going to have a lot more published on what's, what is the nature of these texts. You know, Sean, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, uh, what I really want to do, but I'm a pastor and I don't have the time to, to do it. Um, I, you know, I, I love scholarship. I really, yeah. really do. I, I don't have a lot of time, but, um, you know, um, the, the biggest argument against my view is really the, the, uh, the, the possibility of different literary editions. So the question of Jeremiah you mentioned earlier, yep. or, you know, in, in the Dead Sea, did they have all these different editions that they actually saw as authoritative? They actually saw them as canonical, which it's a very hard thing to prove that they saw these things as canonical. We don't have like a note in the margin that says this. Sure. So a lot of the, the um, consensus view is, oh, well, look, it's a different it's different. Therefore, they saw it as canonical like all the others. And I don't think that's a helpful argument. And here's one reason why. When we look at in context where people clearly believe in a stable text, like Josephus, yep. does he rework his text? Or the rabbis, they clearly believe in authoritative stable text. Mm -hmm. But do they rework their text? What about the Targums? The Targums are the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. And there's lots of crazy differences. There's more differences in the Targum than in the biblical Dead Sea Scrolls, at least the non-aligned text. And yet nobody doubts that the Targums attest to a Masoretic text. Why? Because everybody knows at that time period, the Masoretic text was the canonical text. So, so we have all these differences in the Targums. So you have people changing the text, doing all this reworking. In context, like Josephus, the rabbis, even in Christian context, and uh, and uh, and yet they hold to a stable text. So what I would love to see some people do is to develop really like a a, a model or a paradigm, like Josephus holds to an authoritative text, and yet he reworks it. So if I could show people that, so if I could show people that reworking doesn't necessarily mean that we think the text is fluid, well then that's now a paradigm I could apply to the Dead Sea Scrolls that says, hey, listen, uh, just because there are differences doesn't mean that there's not a canon and authoritative text. In fact, look at the Targums. In fact, look at Josephus, look at the rabbis, look at Christians. All these other examples provide analogies and you don't have any. And not, not to be mean or pedantic, but I think that's a really profitable way forward. That's really interesting. I hope someone listening will share this with a younger <laughs> student who likes biblical languages, Dead Sea Scrolls, and consider going down that road. I'm sure if they did, you'd be willing to talk with them and encourage them, give them a little bit of, little bit of direction. Uh, this Absolutely. has been fantastic. Tell us, uh, last question, just about the institute that you work with, kind of on text and canon. Uh, recently, uh, Peter contacted me and just said, we're doing this blog and the website's launching. I read a lot of the stuff. I watch it. I follow it. I want to encourage all my audience, Christian or not, it's good scholarship that's understandable. Just tell us briefly about that and where people can find it. Well, the Texan Canon Institute is produced by Phoenix Seminary, and the leaders of that institute are Peter Gentry, John Mead, and Peter Gurry. And they've been so kind to uh, let me be involved in writing articles and uh, obviously to giving the lecture at their conference. So I believe the website is textincanonmaybe.org. If you just Google search Texan Canon, you'll, you'll see it. And there's lots of great uh, articles on this website, a lot of great information. And I think one of the things that's unique about it is that it's written for the populace, for the general public. It and is. It, it, it pertains to issues of New Testament and mm -hmm. Old Testament textual criticism. So that's the organization that Peter Gurry and John Mead are doing. And I've just been had, had a privilege to participate. So it's one of my go-to sites that I read and I follow, and it's it's very, very helpful. I want to encourage you, you're a busy guy, but this research here, I'd love to see you produce a popular level book of this, kind of a more than a carpenter length, 120 pages. You could write it. You could hire somebody else to. There's intrigue in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's questions about the Old Testament. I think there's a lot of people that would benefit from this. So for what it's worth... I'm going to encourage you to do a popular book. Hey, those of you watching, make sure you hit subscribe. Here's a couple conversations we have coming up. I uh, have an atheist by the name of Jonathan Gottschall, who's written one of my favorite books in the past five years called The Storytelling Animal. And we're going to talk about the fact that we tell stories 
Does it have an evolutionary explanation or does it maybe point to the fact that we're a part of a story and there's a storyteller? Have a very popular lesbian YouTuber coming on who's not a Christian and we're just going to have a conversation about faith, about YouTube, about culture, and uh, even what she thinks about Jesus. If you thought about studying apologetics, look below. We have a fully online master's program and we would love to train you. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, we have full classes on the canon and reliability and transmission, the very stuff we're talking about here, and it's fully distant. So we want to partner with you in ways that we can. Uh, so those of you watching, make sure you check out the text in the Canon Institute, wonderful resource, and think about joining me at Biola. Dr. Ferguson, thanks again so much uh, for your time. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Sean.